It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Reverend Tom Dennison and I go way back. Uh, well, I figured it out, Tom. We met 30 years ago last month. I know no one can believe that because we look so young, but uh, 30 years ago at Word of Life in Scroon Lake, New York, uh, Tom and I served many years together uh, with Word of Life uh, Philippines uh, here during the late 1980s and 1990s. Uh, Tom was the uh, executive dean of the Word of Life Bible Institute in Laguna for many years. He served as uh, Bible Club uh, director for many years, and uh, him and his wife Sue are blessed with five uh, wonderful daughters. That was to match our five wonderful sons. And <laughs> but Tom is now the uh, director of Titus Far East. He incorporated uh, the Titus Ministries uh, here in the Philippines. Uh, recently, and uh, his ministry is training Filipinos to be missionaries uh, in other countries around the world, and uh, also he is the author of the Activate Youth Ministry that we use here at GCF East uh, with our youth uh, every Sunday morning that Elder Dexter is running. And so we are just delighted that Tom could be here uh, to give us a challenge uh, from the Word of God uh, concerning missions. Tom, come and the Lord bless you as you speak. Fantastic. Thanks. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that fine introduction. Yeah, it's been 30 years, and I look at my friends, I look at my friends that I've had for 30 years, and I say to them, what happened to you? You know, it's, and I, they don't think that about me, of course, but anyway, well, that's great. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you very much. Marami po salamat sa inyong presentation. That's great. Yeah, we really do need, like, uh, you know, biblical literacy and people, you know, engaging and getting into the Bible and reading their Bibles more. That's been a big emphasis in our ministry. So I appreciate that and understand the need for that. In the late 90s, I was in Manila in Quezon City living... Uh, living there, and uh, we were eating mashed potatoes. You know, Americans, we love mashed potatoes. And uh, I was making little swimming pools with the gravy, you know, yung, yung sabaw. And I'm doing that, and my five-year-old Hillary, my five-year-old Hillary said to me, she rebuked me, and said, Daddy, the Bible says don't play with your food. She said that. Yeah, she was convinced, absolutely convinced. There's somewhere in there, it's probably in, you know, I don't know, Zephaniah or something. But she grew up, she grew up, and uh, I, I, she never said this, she never said this, but I swear her life verse, just by the way she lived, by the way she lived, I swear that her life verse was, it is easier to get forgiveness than to get permission. That was her life verse, and she lived it. I mean, she thought it was in 1 Corinthians or something. It, she lived it, you know, she was a doer of the word, and not a hearer only, but uh, anyway, she's a good kid. Hey, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much for the for the chance to share with you about uh, missions. I want to ask you a question. See if this uh, see if we're doing how we're doing here. Oh no, don't don't do that. I, I never look there. I always look there anyway because that's where you're looking. But I'm weird. How do you feel? I want to ask you that question. Let's start off introducing this by asking you this question. How do you feel? How do you feel about missionary life? Is, and now some of you, you're, you're missionaries, you're like Americans, expats, and you're here. Some of you are Philippine missionaries. Well, most of us know you, you have a job, you have a real job, and you go and you work and all that. How would you feel about missionary life? For instance, if God said, or if you just realized, ah, I'm going to be a missionary. God wants me to be a missionary. Or if you just assigned, that was an assignment. You're going to be a missionary. Next year, you're in Japan. Next year, you're in Kazakhstan. Next year, you are in Thailand, you are in Maguindanao, you are something, you are a cross-cultural, let's say cross-cultural missionary next year. You're it, and that's it. That's your career for life. Or maybe your son or your daughter. How do you feel about it? What do you think? What's the word that comes to your mind? Like, oh, wow, missionary, those missionary people out in the jungles and in the big cities and way in some weird country. What are these... <laughs> You know, what is life like? And some of you, you saw the first word. Maybe the first word, the first word you might think of is sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to be a missionary. Is that true? Is that is that really what it's about? Well, certainly that's true for a lot of missionaries. 
It's not the first word that comes to my mind. I've never felt this is a sacrifice to be here until recently. And we're leaving behind our five daughters every time. Leave them behind. Almost six. Almost six grandchildren. Leave them behind. Six ones on the way. But uh, that's the first time I felt like this is a sacrifice. But in general, that's not the way I felt. And you can, there's a few missionaries here. You could ask them. Never felt like this was much of a sacrifice. Some missionaries make more sacrifices than I make, that's for sure. Is that what pops into your head when you think about that or the potential? Maybe <clears throat> you think that's an adventure. That would be an adventure. Take off, new, new place, new sights, new smells, new sounds, new food, new language, new culture. That, that'd be cool. I'd be like getting a job in, uh, in Australia or Dubai or something, a missionary. It'd be an adventure. That's certainly true. A lot of truth to that. It's been an adventure to be here in the Philippines and try to learn Tagalog and eat all this food and eat balut and all that stuff and try to figure out Filipinos and fig Filipino culture and all that. It's certainly been an adventure. It really has. But that's not the first word that comes to my mind, even though it is true. Some of you might just think, it's a hard life. Those jungle people, they go to the jungle and they eat the, the bugs and all that stuff, and it's a rigorous life, a difficult life. That could be true. For me, no. Coming to the Philippines, never thought it's a real hard life. There's a brownout or something in this traffic, but a hard life, no. But for some, yeah, that's true. They live much more rigorous, difficult lives. Maybe because of cultural pressure. Maybe it's environment, it's climate, and it's just, uh, it's a difficult life. Maybe it's, it's money. Some, you, you look, the American missionaries, you say, they, they're okay. They're, they have enough money. Probably true. But then sometimes there's missionaries, they're under supported and they barely make it. There's Filipino missionaries. It's like, it's, it's tough. Maybe it's a hard life. Like being a pastor in, in a lot of small churches. It's a hard life. Not for me, but maybe for some. Maybe you think the opposite. You know, kuya ito, parang baliktad, baliktad naman, easy, madali lang, masarap talaga ang buhay ng mga misyonero. They think they got it easy. I go to work. I go to an office five days a week, six days a week, 40, 50, 60 hours, and I work. I don't really like what I'm doing, and I do it every day. My boss, grabe ang boss ko, he's so nasty, she's so nasty. He said, you know, it is difficult. Competition, the stress, the talk. You know, that's a real job. <laughs> you missionaries, goodness, you work at home. You work at home. You go to the office. You study. You get to deal with nice people all the time. You talk to people about Jesus. That, that sounds like a much easier life. And you get to visit cool places. Maybe it's an easy, well, maybe it is. For some missionaries, sometimes, maybe it is. They got a sweet schedule. I don't know. Um, I haven't found it super easy, but not real hard either. But I'll tell you, this is the word. Okay, This is the word, not just for this message, not just to impress you, or because this will, this will, this will preach. You know, this will be a good message. This is true. You ask me, Tom, 30 years. What do you think? What, do you, what was it like? What do you feel like looking back 30 years? And you probably figured out the word already from the bulletin, but it's a privilege. That's honestly the, like the first Attitude, the first word that comes into my mind. <sighs> this has been good. It means on hard, means on sacrifices. It's an adventure for sure. And sometimes I take a vacation in Puerto Galera and it is masarap. <laughs> Whatever. I can't afford the Caribbean in America, but I can afford uh, Puerto. But, um, but the first thing that comes, it's a privilege. I think about my friends, my faithful Christian friends, my age. They've been working their jobs in the States, which is good. Maybe they love their job. That could be. But I still think, why me, God? This was such a privilege. They did their job, their, you know, five or six days, and then they taught Sunday school, and they did other things. They served, they, they served God, and they, had, they saw fruit. They told people about Jesus. They're, they're busy for Jesus. But I think, oh, my goodness, to be honest, just me, just my ministry, with Word of Life and now the Titus thing. I mean, I have, I was able to stand up and preach the gospel to 400 kids and then see them afterwards being counseled 
and they're coming to Jesus. They're changing their eternity. I got to do that. I got to organize it, maybe. I got to teach students the Bible, right? In Bible Institute days, the teaching these hungry students that want really want to know the Bible. I'd teach them every day. We were able to go out in the streets of the Philippines where it's that like wide open diva, you know, it's a free country, and share the gospel, and they actually listen. Americans don't listen. Filipinos listen. And just all these things that I did all the time. I think, whoa. Thank you, God. I got to go. Dan and Charlie and, and Gary and Steve and Jennifer, they, that's the way I feel. I mean, not, they did what God wanted them to do, but they had to stay behind in America. I got to come here. Thanks. It's such a privilege. Now, that's just me. Maybe I just, I'm weird, you know, and I like eating weird food and balut and all that. And I like language. I like languages. Maybe that's just me. There's another missionary. You've heard of him. He was the big guy, Paul. And he wrote a letter. He wrote a few letters. He wrote this letter to the Ephesians. And he starts off, you know, he's a missionary, right? I mean, he's the, the first big, famous missionary, I suppose. And he, uh, he writes to them. And in two chapters, he's teaching them doctrine. But I think he's convincing them. He's convincing the Ephesian believers you are so privileged. We are so privileged. It's unbelievable. Let's take a look at this, at Ephesians. Okay, I'll look here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. It's in King James, right? Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's like the title of chapters 1 and 2. This is the big point that he's making. And it just it's like a grocery list. I mean, it's organized, but it's like a grocery list of this blessing and this blessing and this blessing and this blessing. Blessed be God. Thank you so much. It's just it's just unbelievable what he laid on us. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessings. I mean, that's kind of just the summary. That's just the summary statement. Spiritual blessings. Such as, example, could you give me one example, Paul? Is there an example of a spiritual blessing like eternal life? Okay, that's one. I can think of one. He goes on, for he chose us in him. You and me are chosen. Think about that. Being chosen before the foundation of the world, we know he chose you. You, 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 me. Why did he choose you? Are you special? Were you smart? Were you holy? Were you sinless? Were you so good? Man, you're going to rock the world for Jesus. I better choose him. No, he just chose you. That is raw privilege. Raw pl- privilege. He said, I'm going to, I am going to save you and you and you. Chose us in him before the creation of the world to be, to be what? Holy and blameless. I'm going to make you blameless and holy before God. What? What? Me, the one who lusts and is, and is selfish and I get angry and I, and I've, I've, I do, I'm violent and I have a temper problem and all the awful things I've done. I will stand before God. I will stand before God. And God will say, Matawidka, righteous God, you're holy, banalka, you have no sin. You're totally right and holy and blameless. <laughs> it's like, that's not even right. That's not even right. That's like, what kind of privilege is that? That's the ultimate privilege. The ultimate thing is what, it's what counts the most, right? You got it. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. Oh yeah, and you're going to be a son of God. You're going to be in God's family. Not the son of the king or the president or a senator or somebody rich or a great dad. You're going to be the son of God. What a privilege. Through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace. In him we have redemption. There's more. I mean, that would be enough to be privileged people, right? In him we have, there's more. In him we have, we've only just started. In him we have redemption. You've been purchased. You are slave to sin. I was a slave to sin in the marketplace. Totally hopeless, sinful people. 
He redeemed us. He bought us through his blood. That was the price he paid. The blood of his son, the death of his son, the shame and humiliation and disgrace and suffering and agony of Jesus. So you're redeemed. <laughs> you're saved. You're free now. You're free. <laughs> the forgiveness of sins. Think about your sin, my sin, all the shameful, stupid things you've done. You would never want to admit them in public. The stupid thing you said, you did, the way you act, the things you think, it all goes through you. And you wish you never did them. Well, you never did them. <laughs> You're forgiven. Slate clean. All gone. No more trace. No probation, period. You don't have to earn it. Just forgiven. 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 You have any sin on your record? Zero. Like that. Zoom. Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I trust you as my Savior. <laughs> forgiven. What a privilege. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, you also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You're saved. Rescued. Rescued. How sweet is that? Saved from what? Sin and hell. Eternity. Eternity away from God in hell, in the flames. You were rescued from that. <laughs> you did nothing. Just trust Jesus and you're saved. I've got a henna tattoo. <laughs> I got a tat. I got a henna tattoo. It's an S. If you can't read it, it means safe. Safe. You could say save, but I like safe. Because <sighs> it means so much to me. I'm safe and my daughters are safe. There was times when I thought maybe they're not safe. Maybe they're not safe. Maybe they're not safe, but I'm convinced they are. And that means so much. What a privilege. You, maybe your children, the people you love the most are safe. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The seal, the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. What kind of ridiculous privilege is that? You have God living inside you. That's like freaky. Like, like who makes this up? You know, can anybody make this up? <laughs> that, okay, not only, yeah, you're like friend of God, son of God, you're in good relationship, he's the king, I'm, yeah, right. He lives in me? Like, nobody makes that up. It's just like a God idea. I'm in you. That's how closely I want to be connected with you. That's how closely I want to be connected with you. I will be in you. I'll be, yeah. It was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. It was skipping right over the deposit part and this, how safe we are. Our inheritance. Inheritance? Wait, 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 wait. Inheritance, that means the future. You know, not in the future. You mean there's more. There's more you, you haven't even seen. More we probably can't even understand. He can't explain heaven. He can't explain the joy. He can't explain the, the colors we'll see and the way we'll feel and just can't even explain it. Can't explain it. There's an inheritance waiting. There's more. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> You're kidding me. You're joking, right, Paul? Until the redemption of those who are God's possession of the praise of his glory. That must be it. That's it. Ah. There's more. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you. That's available, hope. That is so crucial, hope. Some people have no hope. Life rots, life stinks, life is lousy, it's hard, it's tough, and I look at my future and there's nothing there. I look at eternity, there's nothing there. I mean, I don't know what's there. <laughs> Just emptiness. I don't know. Being reincarnated as a cow. I, I don't know what's out there. Right? And you and me, we've got hope. Whatever happens. God's there. He's in control. Yeah. We'll trust you for the future, God. And there's heaven. There's always hope. Which he has called you, the riches of his... Uh, his glorious inheritance, his holy people, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. You feel powerful? Do you have power? Is that your privilege to have power? Well, I can't heal anybody. I don't have those gifts. But I think the power for you and I today is you know, power over sin, power over addictions, things that captivate people, captivated you before. And we struggle and we fight, but there's power. We can get victory. And that's huge. Most people live, they never, never can, never can get victory. You've got power. 
I've got power. You, yeah. And there's more. Another slide. I'm not sure when we finish. But because of his great love for us, God is rich in mercy, made us alive. Made us alive. That's a privilege to be spiritually alive. Before we were dead. No relationship. No spiritual life. Just kind of nothing going on there. Now you're alive. Born again. New life. New lease on life. Holy Spirit inside of you. New nature. All that goes with that. You're alive in God. What a privilege. With Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, and by grace you've been saved. For it is by grace, of oh, these famous verses, by grace you have been saved. We covered that already. We're saved. We're saved. Whatever happens, eternity in heaven, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, a gift of God, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of, Je blood of Christ. You realize, right, in this world, People believe in God. Most of the world believes there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. Where is that God? Oh, Malayo Talaga. <laughs> he, I don't know. He's way out there. He's big. He's high. He's far away. He's not my friend. I don't know how to talk to him. Not really. He's so far. <laughs> and I'm so estranged. There's such a distance. But not you and me. We're brought near. He says, pray. We'll get to pray later, but we're near, close to God, a breath away. We take it for granted. We already know that all the time, right? Because we're Christians. Such a piece of wealth that we're near. We're so close to God. When will this ever end? And in one body to reconcile, reconcile. You are enemy of God. You are an enemy of God, a rebel. And he says, no more, no more, no more, no more. The door is wide open. The door is wide open. Here's the walkway. The table is set. Come on in. Just walk in. Nothing between us anymore. Reconciled both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death. For through him, we both have access to the Father. What's that? Access to the Father. It's prayer, I think. Access to the Father by one spirit. You've got to be joking. Again, we know. Oh, yeah, prayer, prayer. Yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> you know many of your neighbors. It's not the same for them, even. And people in Thailand and Taiwan and Kazakhstan and Islamic countries, it's not the same. You talk. You talk to God. I talk to God. He is listening. He is listening. He is interested in what you have to say. He has nobody else to listen to. You're, you are his only appointment this morning. Huh? Is that true? Well, he's infinite, so he can pull that off. It's like it's just you and me. What do you, what do you need, son? What do you need? Anak, daughter, friend, what do you want? Now, what kind of ridiculous privilege is that? Anytime, any problem, any praise, any happy thought, any request, just, just talk. <laughs> Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. Fellow citizens with God's people. Is that the end? Okay, there we go. Did you get the point yet? Did you get the feeling yet? That's We're not exegeting all that. It's just a little bit as we blast through. This is the point. This is the biggest point of my message. After this, you want to, if you're really tired, you're really sleepy, you can go to sleep if you want, but you just you got the whole thing right here. I am rich. We go through that, and I think that's what Paul is saying. We are privileged. We are so rich. We are Henry C. And I mean, forgive me to use personal names. People, you know, sort of. Henry C. and Lucio Tan and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Zuckerberg and these guys. They're rich. I mean, they are really wealthy people. And you are as well. Not your bank account, whatever. Spiritually, 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 you and me. We are the Bill Gates and Warren Buffetts and Zuckerbergs and the, the bankers of this country. That's who we are. I am rich. You believe that. You think that. You feel that. That that's where you sit right now. Let's, we're going to say it together. Okay, this is like Sunday school class. I want you to say it. We're going to say it about three times. Are you ready? We'll do it in English. Later this afternoon, we do it in Tagalog. Here we go. I am rich. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. I am rich. You feel it? I mean, you feel it? Like, I don't know if I feel that. Here we go. One more time. Here we go. I am 
Rich. I love that, that, it's that, that English word, rich. I don't know what it is. I don't know who made up that word. It sounds rich. I don't know. It's just like rich. Okay. <laughs> Say it one more time. Here we go. I am rich. And you are. You're not just, oh, I'm doing okay. I'm middle class. I mean, no, you are rich in Jesus Christ. Yeah. It would be a fun thing to be rich, <laughs> to have a billion dollars, I always thought. Not because, well, I can buy a mansion and two Mercedes Benz and the best guitars possible and take my vacations in Dubai or any place. Not that. That's like, yeah, whatever. I, really, it doesn't appeal to me that much. And this, I'm no hero. I think you're probably the same. But how fun would it be to do what these guys are doing? Bill Gates giving away, you know, $40 billion and all this stuff to change people's lives. I mean, with education, with medicine, with orphanages, with this, with that, with financing, with jobs, and just spread it around. That would be so fun <laughs> to be rich. Now, you're rich, spiritually speaking. But it's not that way for everybody else. The people of, where is that? What country is that? Oh, it, it is labeled. Okay, Vietnam, 84 million. That's almost the whole country. That's almost the population of Philippines. Among 100 million, it's the Philippines, diba? 84 million live in unreached areas. He's just going to look at the other part of the world, the other half, or other two-thirds, I suppose, of the world. They live in unreached areas. What does that mean? Don't uh, tok tok ng bundok. They live up there and they're unreachable. No, they live in cities. It means that they have no hope. It means they don't know Jesus. They don't know the gospel. They don't know who Jesus is. Maybe never heard the name. Maybe heard the name. They have no Christian neighbors. Maybe never even met a Christian. They are true. They're unreached. Absolutely hopeless. They will live, die be in hell, Christless eternity, and they never heard. 84 million. It also means, now there's a few Vietnamese Christians. There are, certainly. But they're few. Maybe they're poor. Who longs are training? They have very little training. Their resources, their materials. It's just, it's just really infancy stage. And just realistically, when missionaries say they're an unreached people group, it means if, if a foreigner doesn't come, someone does not come from Canada, uh, U.S., Philippines, somewhere, there's no hope. They will not hear. They will die without Jesus Christ. They're the opposite end. They are mehirap. They are pulubi. They are dukha. They are everything, you, whatever you want to say. They have nothing. They're the squatters of the spiritual world. And they live across the... What is that? The West Philippine Sea? What are we going to call it? You know, we, ah, we won't go into that. All right. A lovely body of water. They're right over there. That long oras lang ang flight, di ba? And Thailand, 96%. These, that's like everybody. Halos lahat. They're just big groups of 20 million Isan people. They, they're business people and they wealthy. They just don't know who Jesus is. Not really. If missionaries don't go, forget it. Walang pagasa talaga. That's Thailand. Cambodia, ridiculous. You can go to Cambodia. There are missionaries there. My, my daughter just married someone whose parents are missionaries there, Americans. Maybe she will go there as a missionary and rescue women, right? Big sex slave trade and all that. But anyway, 99%, yeah, 99% on reach. They are your neighbors, my neighbors, across the pond over there. And they are so poor. Maybe if we put a face to it, it's better than statistics. These are the lost. These are the poor, unreached. They've got, they've got zero. You're, 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 Bill, you're Bill Gates. They're whoever, right? Maybe it's this. There we go. Close up. That's the face. That's the face of so many. Am I playing with your emotions? Absolutely. God gave us the emotions. Captive, captive to Satan, captive to sin, captive to dead religions of Buddhism and Islam and atheism or whatever, just just captive. There's no way out. They can't buy their way out, pay their way out, think their way out. This is nothing. That's your neighbors. That's our neighbors. We could go to Maguindanao as well. Unreached people. They don't know about Jesus down there. 
And there you are. That's you. Kahit puti, kahit puti siya. That's you in the middle. I could not find a Filipino picture. I just wasn't there. Because Filipinos don't do this as much like Americans with the big pile of presents. But I thought it was a good picture, okay? So that's you and me in the middle. Parents are wealthy. Nice house. Lots of presents at Christmas time, birthday, graduation. It's like, <gasps> look at all this. I'm so lucky. I'm so suerte. Look at me. And there's, there's the other side. There's the little girl. Let me ask you, how should the, how should the boy feel if, if he sees, he sees on television, he sees on internet, he sees the girl, he sees that. What's his emotion? Should he feel guilty? I have so much food, I have bicycles, I have toys, I have everything. Guilt, it doesn't help. <laughs> it's not necessary. He should feel privileged. He should feel privileged. Never take it for granted. Like, look what I have. And there are people that have... It. That's you and me. That's the picture. For me, that's the picture. Spiritually. That's, he is a Filipino Christian. He's an American Christian, a Canadian, whatever you want to say. But you're Filipino, most of you. He's a Filipino Christian. And those are his neighbors. Yeah. That's why Paul goes on. <laughs> and I feel privileged, and I'm convinced Paul felt so privileged to have wealth. Okay, we saw the privilege, your little outline there, the privilege of having wealth. Here's the privilege of giving it away. And Paul did not live an easy one, right? Easy life. It was difficult. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. He's already been, you know, beaten up and left for dead probably and arrested and risking his life, shipwreck, all that stuff. And he says, what do you think, Paul? What is your impression of your career? Oh, this has been such a gift, a gift of God's grace. It's like a grace of God's grace. This is like, wow, I got to do this, given me through. Now, why? Why is this such a gift, Paul? Why do you look at this as such a gift? I mean, this was a hard life. It's suffering most of the time. It was given me through the working of his power. What is? What are the privileges of sharing wealth, according to Paul? The working of his power. He knew this was powerful. What I'm doing is powerful. It's the gospel. The gospel is powerful. Psychology, psychiatry, you know, just helping people with different facets of their life. It's nice. But <laughs> the gospel changes eternity, frees people from their sin, their, again, their addictions and the problems and the awful relationships and the hopelessness. It's powerful. It changes lives, communities, cultures. It really does. This is a powerful, and you have that sitting in your lap, in your hands, in your Bible, in the gospel, in your, the secret. You have a secret. For Thais and Vietnamese and Kazakhs, it's a secret. This powerful, powerful thing. Be like a cure for cancer or a way to make a billion dollars. It's powerful what you have. Then he says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, he felt this is undeserved. This is why it's a privilege. I did not deserve this. <laughs> I mean, I persecuted the church. W why was I, of all people, given this privilege? Maybe you feel undeserving just because, I don't know, I, I've done some stupid things in my life. I've been very a lukewarm Christian. You know, they tell me that in America, I don't know about here, but in the Western world, lots of young men will say, I cannot be a missionary. Why? Because of the internet. Because of my mind has been so polluted. I just, I just, oh, I just don't deserve it. I just, I just couldn't. It'd be such a hypocrite. I'd be such a failure to go and tell people. It has really made them a captive in that sense. If you've got things in your past, 
and you think, no, I, I, I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. Don't worry about it. Paul killed people. He's the greatest and public and church enemy number one. He's a bad guy. Big jerk, we would have said, in America. And God said, you, you're the one. Don't worry about whatever has happened in your life. It's undeserved anyway. It's grace. You want to be a missionary? You want to have the privilege? Don't think, oh, i got to earn this. No. I mean, you need a good character. But your past, your past is forgiven. To preach, to preach, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. <laughs> That's why it's a privilege. I, whatever your ministry is, I mean, I mean, if you're teaching, you know, missionary kids, or some of you at Faith, Faith Academy, or you're going over, you're like a, you're, you're backing up the preachers, or you're a preacher, you're sharing the gospel, planting a church, doing youth ministry, teaching at a seminary, I mean, whatever it is, you will be involved <laughs> in, in bringing rich, lavish truths. They just never stop, right? We saw that. Sumasagana talaga ang mga kayamanan ng Diyos that we have. Just overflowing. It just never ends. We are so familiar with them that these truths are just incredible, mind-blowing, my life-changing truths. They're so rich. That's how he felt. Boundless riches. What a privilege to, to be a missionary. Just to put it bluntly. I, uh, a little story, a little story, wrap it up, almost done. Um, yeah. Um, imagine your house, maybe you have children, maybe you're in the brother-sister uh, level here, but a phone call comes in, an email, a Facebook message comes in, and it's good news. It's really, really, really good news about Ate, your older sister, older brother, you know, they're in America or Dubai or something, and or in Manila, or you live in Manila. Anyway, somewhere. And the news comes in. And the three children will then begin to argue who's going to tell daddy when he comes home. He doesn't know yet. He's at the office. He doesn't check his email there. And it was a phone call anyway. And so when he comes home, who's going to tell him? And they, I, 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 I want to tell him. I want to tell him, says the youngest. The oldest says, I answered the phone. I got the text. I, I want to tell them about Ate. And they're all excited. Because it's just so exciting to share good news. To share great news. And that should be you and me. It's not always me. Probably not always you. Oh, can I tell? Can I go tell them? Can I go to Thailand? Can I go to Kazakhstan? Can I go to Saudi? Can I go to... Vietnam, can I go, can I be the one to start that orphanage, to talk to those young people, to learn that language, to start a church? Can I be the one to bring them out of that? Please, can I do it? Like you're a little kid. And God might say, no, no, not you. <laughs> not you. I got another job for you. But I'm just, ah. that would be cool if that was our feeling. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaways for you. Apps for privileged people. Everyone. This is takeaway for everyone. Takeaway, everyone in this room. Just call yourself rich. Let's do it one more time. I am rich. Here we go. I am rich. Just get up in the morning. And some of you, you get up in the morning, you look the salamin. You look in there and you say, <laughs> go up, okay. That's what you say. Okay, you can say that, but then say, maya manka. Maya manka. You're rich. And believe it. Maybe that's a good experiment. This week, every morning, look in the mirror and say, you are rich. You are rich, man. Okay, call yourself rich, because you are. Next, everyone, everyone, decide to share your wealth. I mean, that's like a track. That's you know, share the gospel at work, invite people to church. You know, just say, God, I'm so rich. Even, you know, they don't know either. And I want to share my wealth. Just help me, God. I'm such, I'm so shy. And I'm such a coward that I don't do that. But anyway, God, help me to do that. Or maybe give my money or support a missionary or something. Everyone, everyone, oh, everyone that's a parent. Here you go, here you go. And this is going to be offensive and you don't like it. Release your kids. Release your kids. I talked to uh, quite a few young professionals, college kids, Filipinos, 
And they say, oh, I'd like to be missionary. Oh, really? Ano ba ang pinakahadlang mo? Ha? What's your biggest obstacle? Parents ko. <laughs> that's, very, that's the number one answer. Number one answer, parents ko. I know you want them to be an engineer, lawyer, doctor, take over family business. I understand. That's your social security system. That's your retirement. I understand. I'm talking to Asian parents and all that. And that's the way it works. You have to wrestle with that. I can't tell you. I can't expect this. But you're wealthy. Your child is wealthy. This would be a big step. This would be a huge step of faith if you just put that. It's my challenge. It comes from me. If you think it comes from God, just you just tell them. Hey, you know, you want to be a missionary? Because I'm too old. You want to be a missionary? You're free. That would be huge. That would be huge for missions if you would just for your kids. Here we go. Number, this is not for everyone. This is for someone. Someone here. Become a missionary. Maybe even cross-cultural missionary. Maybe another nation. Somebody. But I'm just saying, GCF, wow, this is a pretty big church. You people are smart. You're educated. You're rich. I don't mean financially rich. We're whatever. Some are. Some are not. If nobody... If nobody becomes a missionary in this room, nobody, not one young person says, I will go. Can I go? I don't know. Maybe it's my opinion. I think there's a problem. Maybe you don't like me anymore. I, don't, I liked him before. I don't like him now. You don't like me. I think it's a problem. Somebody ought to go. I don't know who, but somebody ought to go. All right. Here we go. Now we're gonna, now we're really gonna torture you here. We're gonna sing a song. And uh, now they'll, they'll do the clicky, clicky from behind, just to give it a little. Uh, I'm just a hack. I am no, I am no Chris Tomlin, that's for sure. You will find that out. And uh, sometimes I forget the words. Don't be embarrassed. I'll be embarrassed enough. Okay, I guess I got the words here. <laughs> just to give it a little, a little emotional punch. It's a great song. Now the first verse is about. Uh, he's on an airplane. Sometimes first verse. What? What's he talking about? He's he's in an airplane coming home. He's in a 747, or whatever. And here he goes. You can sing along. You know the words. Sing along. Or you can say, yeah, 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 when we get to that part. Look down from a broken sky, traced out by the city lights. My world from the high. The seat in the house tonight Touch down on the cold black top Hold on for the sudden stop Breathe in the familiar shock of confusion And chaos All those people Going somewhere Why have I never cared? Oh, give me your eyes for just one second Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted Ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Yeah, yeah, you can sing that Yeah, yeah Yeah, yeah Yeah, yeah Step out on a busy street See a girl and our eyes meet She does her best to smile at me To hide what's underneath There's a man just to her right Black suit and a bright red tie Too ashamed to tell his wife He's out of work, he's buying time All those people Going somewhere Why have I never just give me your eyes for just one second Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted Ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Yeah, yeah Yeah, yeah Yeah, yeah yeah, yeah. Been there a million times, a couple of million eyes, just moving past me by. I swear I never thought that I was wrong. I want a second glance, 
So give me a second chance to see the way you see the people all alone. Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the broken hearted, ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. Oh, give me your eyes. Lord, give me your eyes for everything that I keep missing. Lord, give me your arms for the broken hearted. Give me your eyes. Give me your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lord, give us uh, your eyes to see. Let's give us your eyes just to see how wealthy we are and how poor others and what a privilege it is and it would be. Just stir us up like that, we pray, Lord, and call some of us out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.